guests each week, bringing you the best relationship advice. Welcome to Oxygen 365. I'm your host, Noel Metter, and this is episode number 24. Today's guests are Scott and Bethany Palmer, also known as The Money Couple. The Palmers are financial coaches and authors of several books on money and relationships, including The Five Money personalities. They are regulars on national TV and radio and speak internationally about love and money. Together, Scott and Bethany have more than uh, 43 years of financial planning experience, and they are dedicated to helping couples strengthen their financial relationship. Scott and Bethany, thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks for having us. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the topic that we're covering today is probably one of the more sensitive, uh, difficult topics that couples experience and quite honestly ends up moving them to the divorce court or into the therapy office, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You guys know this firsthand, not because of personally, but because of all the, the, the families that you've worked with. Uh, and maybe that, I just want to start with this leading question. What is it about money that wreaks havoc on relationships? Well, I think a couple things. Your statistics are absolutely right. There's a 50% divorce rate. 70% of all divorces cite money as the number one reason for fighting in their relationship. So it's really of an epidemic it's, you know, proportion in this country. Even though Bethany and I are the money couple, we still have stress occasionally <laughs> every once in a while when it comes to money. So we're really there in the trenches with couples as we, as we try to really figure out why they're causing so much tension. And here's the bottom reason. The bottom line is that money affects just about every aspect of our life on a daily basis. I just ran home, I live about five minutes home uh, away from my office, so probably not even that much, it's probably two minutes from my house. And as I'm flying home, I'm having this conversation in my head. Should I pick something up after we get done with this interview or should I just make myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich real quick and eat it on the way back? <laughs> I opted for the peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the way back because it was quick and easy. But then I'm thinking, do I need to pick her something up for lunch or should I just bring her something? So I whipped something together really quick for her in my five minutes at home too. Did that have a money component? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Did it have a relationship component? Absolutely. So it doesn't matter if it's going home for lunch. It doesn't matter if it's the Starbucks coffee on your way to work. All these kind of decisions, what kind of gasoline car? you put in your car, what kind of, my youngest he starts football practice in a day and he's like, dad, we have to go buy me cleats. Will you take me? That means he knows I'll spend more money on the cleats than she will. It doesn't have anything to do with personal time. It's all about the footwear. But here's the reality. All of those decisions stack up. And if you're not agreeing about those decisions, if you're arguing about those decisions, you're going to end up with a relationship that is way stressed out about money. And that's why we created the five money personalities, because what happened is about seven years ago, we had this very affluent couple come in that we were doing financial planning for. And basically they sat down. It was one of those conversations where it's just like hyper, hyper tense Tension, in the room. Yeah. Hmm. And you're like, did I say something last time we met? <laughs> hmm. What are we picking up on? So finally I was like, you guys, what's wrong? Like, why is there so much tension? And she said, well, we're here to split up our assets because we're getting divorced. Hmm. And we were looking at each other like, what? what? So I'm, I'm, I'm instantly like, no way. Is he addicted to porn? Or did she, you know, sleep with another guy? I mean, what, you know, what's really going on? So I asked him, why? And what she said put us on this mission that we're having right now. Hmm. Because what she said rocked our world because she said we're getting divorced over money. So, okay, so we're the financial planners here and they're getting divorced over money. Um, what do you do with that? And I was like, what do you mean you're getting divorced over money? Look at all these awesome graphs I have for you. You guys are set for retirement. Your house is almost paid off. You are you are picture perfect right. when it comes to money. That doesn't make any sense to me. But they said, we just can't get along about money. So that night, we, we literally spent the next hour splitting up their assets, one of the worst days of my life. And so we went, we went back to our um, house that night and said, let's get online and find them a resource. Guess what? There were no resources. Mm. There's plenty of resources on how do you create a budget? How do you have the perfect retirement plan? Uh, what is a life and trust supposed to look like? Do you have enough life insurance? But it, when it came down, how do you agree about money? On a day-to-day -day basis. On a day-to-day -day basis, there was nothing. So that, that put us on just an amazing journey of saying, we have to create resources for couples to use in this situation mm -hmm. so that they don't get divorced. And so for the last seven years, and five books later, and 60,000 people in the last 18 months taking this money personality assessment that we have online, 
we're really, praise the Lord, really getting to the heart of the matter, mm -hmm. which is that, guess what? Everybody has a money personality. Mm -hmm. You don't have one, you have two. You have a primary and a secondary. And guess what? Of the 60,000 people that have taken it, 80% of couples that have taken it are opposite with their money personality. Yeah, I believe so it. So when we sat down and did the, re the research and looked at what this quiz showed us, it was like, well, yeah, people are getting divorced over this. They're married to their money opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was reading on your guys' website, you have a pretty audacious goal of, uh, what is it, 10? You're going to drive down the divorce rate by 10%? That's yes, huge. here's here here's why. Because if you think about that statistic, that seventy percent of divorces are over money, and if we can nip this, if we can help and give a resource so people know what they're getting into before they're married, as they're married, improve and understand why they see the things the way they do, and have a, a have some kind of intentional compromise when it comes to money decisions in a way that's going to bring, bring them together. Mm -hmm. That's why we believe we can do it mm. because people just want to think that money inside of a relationship all has to do with having your financial house in order. Having your financial house in order is super important, but there's a whole nother side to money. That's the day to day money talk that you have. The, what kind of gasoline are you going to put in your car? Are you going to go to Starbucks or brew your coffee at home? Are you going to bag your lunch? Or are you going to go out to lunch? Those are decisions that you make every day. And if you two are not on the same wavelength about it, that's where the breakdown happens. We just had an email so, come in. Let me ask, just, let me ask this question. So are you talking about if a couple has a budget together, then that they're going to be okay? No, no way. Okay. So okay. tell me, tell me more about that. Cause I know that's one of the things in your book. It's not just about a budget, which most people think, Hey, if we have a sound budget and we're both agreed to that budget, we're going to be golden. Here's the thing. Usually the person who's more on the saver security seeker side of things puts the budget together. <laughs> the other person has absolutely no buy into that. Uh -huh. You think you're going to be, you're crazy if you think that they're going to abide by that budget <laughs> because they had no say in it. Right. And what happens is the saver and security secret kind of money personalities get all excited. You know, I know exactly how we can get out of debt or I know exactly how to do it. And the other person's looking at them like they're nuts. There's no room in there for any kind of flexibility. It's never going to happen. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it was interesting. We saw a, a television interview not all that long ago. And the host was uh, interviewing a, a expert from their, um, from their TV station. And she said, she said, you know, what's really important is that the saver in the money in the relationship teaches the spender how to save. And I'm like, oh, what luck. are we two? You know, what come what on. planet no, are you never on? Gonna happen. <laughs> you can learn to be smart about your money yeah. as a personally, I'm primary spender, secondary risk taker. But I have savings because I've learned how important saving is. Mm. So it's not that I don't save and that I can't save. I've learned how important it is. But no saver and security seeker needs to teach me how to save. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So it gets into this parent-child kind of relationship. You're right. You're wrong. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when the, the relationship starts to just dwindle away. We just had a radio interview the, um, this morning. And the gentleman who called in, he said, well, I... We don't have as much money as we used to have. We used to have a lot more. And, you know, I have my wife has champagne taste, but we are on a beer budget. How do I get her to change? Mm. And then he I said, give me some examples. And he said, he said, well, we need to be saving, but she keeps spending. And I'm like, well, how much do you have in savings? And he's like, didn't even know. And he just was like, we just need to save. We just need to save. We just need to save. Driving her nuts. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing every day all across America. And this has got to stop if we're going to take our marriages back. So what would you say to that scenario? I mean, what is the first step for someone like that who, you know, saying we got to save, but doesn't have any idea of what they're dealing with in their financial and it's killing their relationship? What's the first step? Well, the, the first step is compromise. The first step is that she has just as much right to spend as he does save. And see, the problem with our money personalities, or not the problem with our money personalities, but the problem with us is we assume our money personality is the better one because <laughs> it's ours. It's in mm -hmm. our DNA. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like if, if, if I turned to Bethany and said, I need you to start having blonde hair instead of red hair. Well, that wouldn't make any sense because that's who she is. And these money personalities, although we can learn how to adjust and make some changes, they really are who we are. So what, he, what we told him to do is first thing, 
you need to get specific on exactly what you need, mm -hmm. how much needs to be saved, and how much do you need to have in you know your checking emergency account, account, your emergency account, and how much in your retirement. And then you need to go to her and say, how much do you realistically think we should spend? And then you start to work the compromise. You don't come at it from, we need to save, we need to save, we need to yeah. save, or we need to spend, we need to spend. You really have to compromise, but you have to understand your money personalities. Yeah. Because if you understand the money personalities, then you're not surprised that she spent something because guess what? She's a spender. You're not surprised when he's worried What's about life thing? insurance or the savings account because guess what? He's a saver. Yeah. And so once you understand those money personalities, you do two things. You learn how to extend the other person grace, which we're terrible at doing in our relationships anyways. And secondly, you learn how to communicate in a different way. So that's really the key. We said you come up with your plan of action, you get her input, and then you come together with that compromise. So I got to ask the question. I think all of our listeners are on the edge of their seat going, okay, the money personality is driving this. What is it? Well, I mean, you guys have come sure. up with five money personalities. What are they? Well, let me um, just start off by saying that it, there really are 25 different combinations. Oh no, I was hoping you weren't going to say that. See, because- <laughs> That's way too complex. Right, exactly. And so I think what happens sometimes is people want to go just to their primary and think about just their primary, but it's really your combination of both. So let me give you an example because I can cover four of them here, um, three of them actually between us. So we're both primary spenders, okay? Now spenders. Spenders are the people who like to spend money on themselves, but they also like to spend money on other people. Those gift givers, you know, when you go to a party and you say no gifts, please, but they bring a gift anyway. Right. I mean, those are your spenders. Yeah. So we're both primary spenders. That's one of our money personalities. But secondarily, we're totally opposite. I'm a risk taker, which means I like adventure. I like change. I like new. I like different. I like go for it. That's kind of my mantras. Let's do it. Why not? And Scott is a security seeker. So he likes a total plan in place. Don't give me all those surprises. I don't like new mm -hmm. adventure. I like to go to the same restaurant. If we went to the same restaurant every week for the rest of our marriage, it would be fine with him. No problem. Right. I know what I'm getting. Yeah. So, but I don't have that. I want a different one. So that's where we have. So a security seeker wants a plan. Spender likes to spend and mm -hmm. spend on themselves and others. And a risk taker likes to adventure. Those are three of the five. Those, but you see how the combination of yes. the two is so important. Right. And it's very interesting to, to realize what your two are and then to see if they're opposite. We'll have people take the assessment like Scott, primary spender, secondary security seeker. What? Mm, yeah. We have people who are primary spenders secondary savers. So is he conflicted inside? Yeah, it's it's absolutely. <laughs> so when we're speaking in front of large audiences and and, and takes about us about 30 minutes to explain something called the opposite dynamic and it's where you have one money personality on one side of the spectrum and another money personality is on the opposite side of the spectrum. I before I even explain it, I can ask an entire crowd, does anybody here deal with buyer's remorse? 70 to 80% will lift their hands up and I go, "You have something that I'm about to explain." called the opposite dynamic. Because what that opposite dynamic is, I spend money, but then on the way home, she's ready to throw me out of the car because I'm regretting every single purchase that we made. Because oh, it wasn't in the plan. That. I personally probably returned 50% of everything I buy. I keep the tags on it for a week and about half the stuff goes back, <laughs> even if it's in need, because I've got this sense of security that I have to have. And if it doesn't fit the budget, if it doesn't fit the long-term planning, that security seeker is always going to pull me back. So if you've got the opposite dynamic, you're confusing as a person, but you're really confused to be married to too because they never know where you're landing. It's like, right. oh, is he going to be happy you spent money or are we going to go into the morning on the way home <laughs> from the mall? And so understanding these money personalities, it just helps people click. So we were speaking at a, a really large women's event a couple months ago and this lady and her daughter she, we were signing books and, and selling product and she came flying up to our table and she's like, I have a problem. So I'm like, okay. I said, can you hold on a second? And I said, how can I help you? She goes, well, during your presentation, I took the assessment and I'm like, well, thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> but what'd you find? And she says, well, it's, it says I'm a primary spender and a secondary saver. And that just doesn't make any sense. I turned to her daughter. I said, what is her favorite thing to do on the weekend? And she goes, well, we both are this way. We love to shop. Like we hit 
we hit the shops at eight o'clock and I turned to her and I said, have you ever spent full price for something? You would have thought I swore in church by the look on her face. She just got this ghastly and she was like, well, no, of course not. We always started the clearance racks. <laughs> I was like, did you hear what you just said? And she smiled, laughed, and walked away. There wasn't even a good vibe. But, um, <laughs> She's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, yeah, right. You were right. That makes me mad. So she left. But that's that's what we deal with. Mm. And that really happens as couples. If I'm a primary saver, and she's a primary spender, we are going to butt heads about every 30 seconds with mm. everything that we do. Vacations, horrible. Birthday's horrible. Anytime one wants to spend and the other doesn't want to spend, there's tension. Anytime one wants to save and the other doesn't, there's tension. Wow. So that's why it's so important to understand these money. Yeah. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I <coughs> love that you've described the, the, uh, the five different types of personalities. How much is this influenced by our circumstances and traumatic events that can, can, can someone go from one to the another, uh, another personality based on trauma or life circumstances? That is a very good question. We get that question a lot. And this is the best way that we've come up with to describing it. Your money personalities are in your DNA. Mm. And here's a great example. If you think about your Halloween candy when you were a kid, and what did you do? Once you got that Halloween candy, what did you do with it? Mm -hmm. Did you save it? I know my, my nephew, he has Halloween candy from one Halloween to the next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did he save it? Did he eat it quickly? spender? Did he have a plan with it? Did he put all the Tootsie Rolls together and all the, you know, have this total plan with it? Security seeker. Did he trade it? Do you trade it? If you trade risk taker, are you a flyer, which is one of our other money personalities, which are all about relationships. You fly by the seat of your pants when it comes to money, hmm. but a flyer would be all about giving the candy away. Give it to their friends. Give it to your friends. So I think about myself when I was a kid, I'm a spender risk taker. Yeah. I would eat it really fast. And I would trade it with my friends. Yeah. That I no one taught me that. Right. It just happened. Now, here's the thing. In order to be a super well-rounded person, whatever money personalities are not your primary or secondary, you learn how to do them. Hmm. Um, for example, saver. I'm have nowhere savers like I swear it's my last. Um, but I know how to save. I do save because I know it's important. Mm -hmm. And so now when you ask about traumatic situations and your family and all of that, it's very interesting. So some people go, oh, well, he came from the depression age. So that's why he saves all his money. Right. That's what I was but then thinking. You get, but then you get people, he comes from the depression age. That's why he spends all his money. Mm. I mean, you, you, it's not, it, no, that's who he is. He is a saver or a spend primary saver. So he would have been a spend. saver before the depression. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. Now, here's the thing. You either mimic your family dynamic or you rebel against it. Uh -huh. So let's take myself, for example. My mom is a primary saver, secondary security seeker. Okay. So way on the spectrum of saver and security seeker. I'm way on the other side of the spectrum. I'm spender risk taker. Yeah. We could not be more opposite. And she is like, such a saver, in, but I'm not a spender risk taker because I'm rebelling against her. I'm just different than her. But the fact that we were so different and we didn't understand our money personalities growing up, there was so much tension about everything. Yeah. You know, I needed a new swimsuit as a nationally ranked swimmer. I needed a new swimsuit. I tell her and she just, Oh my gosh, $35. And just, I mean, and that, and that as a spender made me feel like I wasn't worth it. Yeah. So you've got these psychological ramifications of not understanding this and not understanding your child's money personalities are absolutely key. You can be squelching them and not even knowing it. Mm -hmm. You know, why does every dollar that you get burn a hole in your pocket? You know, those kind of snide comments didn't sit well with me because that wasn't my natural bent. Right. But if she would have said, hey, you know, why don't you save that dollar so you can spend it next week. I would have been like, woohoo, let's do it. So really important yeah, real and, stuff. So, and I think that's really, I mean, it's, it's awesome that you guys have a tool and it sounds like it's in a, a free assessment. Is that right? Yes. That's so a free, a free assessment, assessment takes you 10 minutes. That's so amazing. I mean, that's so amazing. You guys are giving this away for free to go find out what your personality, your money personality is. But I think the bigger challenge is not so much figuring out because you guys will do that for 
these couples. Yes. It's okay. how do you reconcile the difference between these money personalities? And what would you say to that? I mean, how does that happen? Well, it, it happens with, it's, it's funny because one of the things when Beth and I started this whole thing, when we really said, what, what can we offer couples? How we, can we get them talking? We said, we have to make it easy. Anytime you make it complicated, it's going to naturally drive away about 80% of the population. Yeah, thanks, so God. the easier you make it, the better. So in the five money personalities, the subtitle is speaking the same love and money language, because really it's about understanding what the money personalities are. And then we go through in the book and say, if you're a spender, here's some words that you use. Here's some words that you need to hear. And these are words that aren't going to work for you. Mm. If, if with my, um, I, I don't even call our budget a budget. I call the cash flow worksheet because it shows activity to me. It's money coming in and out. It's a flow. Right. It's not a budget. When I think of budget, I think of angry people. And so, um, <laughs> but that's just me as a financial advisor. So, um, but that, that's, you know, so that, that's part of it. In the book, what we do is we say, here's how you work together as a team. Here's what this person needs to hear from you. But here's what you can do for this person too. So vacations, I'm a security seeker. So I like to go where I know it's going to be safe, where I know I'm going to be able to plan the activities down to a T and where I know we're not going to get there and be like, this is horrible. So I would literally go to the same place for vacation every year. The first, the first four years of having kids, we, <laughs> we did Walt Disney World. We stayed at the same location. We ate at the same places. And I loved it. I was a security <laughs> seeker. I was like, I was in the zone, baby. I was there. How did that go she, for you, Bethany? Right. <laughs> Finally, after the, it was the, the fourth year, I was like, honey, really? Four years? Come on. We, we had the magnets, man. We had the 2008. <laughs> yeah. We had the magnets. It was perfect. They had, they, was, they, you guys were on first so name fun. basis there. Right, right. 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 <laughs> But it was so funny because then we, after I had said, okay, honey, I mean, because who doesn't want to go to Disney World? I mean, Disney World is so fun. It's a blast. But um, after that, we started saying every year we're going to do, um, I decide and then he decides and yeah. then I decide, he decides. So every other year we're doing something unique and different. Last year we- Actually, we did two years in a row where I let you choose. That's true. Because, to kind of make up for it. Yeah, I had kind of, <laughs> I had kind of monopolized yeah. vacations, I guess. But it really, that see, but here's the thing. This is how we're able to have a conversation about this because mm -hmm. I said, honey, I said, your security seeker is like, is awesome. However, it's making us go to the same place every single year. And me as a risk taker, that just is not exciting to me. And he got it. And I got it. And we yeah. weren't going, oh, you're such a stick in the mud. You ever want to go to the same place? We're not talking like that. We're saying it is who we are. So yeah. let's accept it and let's have compromise in an intentional way. When one person in a relationship feels like they're compromising all the time, that doesn't feel very good. And after a while, they just say, I'm not going to do it anymore. But if you're both trying to serve each other, that's your goal is to like serve each other, get to know each other, understand each other, appreciate each other. Um, then you're both trying to satisfy each other's money personalities just as much. Right. And that's what gives you harmony. And that's what we want. We want relationship harmony. We want relationship prosperity. And that's the way that you do it. But you do have to be intentional with it. That's why we wrote the book. Yeah. So it sounds like in the, when they get the uh, personality assessment back, there's some key buzzwords, some statements that ring true to their personality, which is all well and good. But I think it takes a little bit more. And I think you probably agree with this in terms of actually figuring this out and, and reconciling our differences. Oh, yeah. You guys have come up with some great exercises, um, I think, that couples can work together on to really flesh this out. I know one of them was the money dump, and I thought, yeah. Yeah. I got to have this, you guys talk about this. So. This is a great one. So we kind of, and we go into this really in detail, because this is like a three-hour seminar that we give okay. on all these different things. But the first one is the money dump. And the money dump is where, and it's, it's very structured, because the money dump can get a little crazy. Because what you're doing is you're basically dumping all the good, but more importantly, all the bad of your money relationship and you're getting it out of the table. As a matter of fact, we separate you in different rooms. <laughs> you have boxing because, gloves? I mean. That's right. <laughs> because we don't want you looking at each other, each other's lists. And then we tell you exactly how many you choose. And then those are the first two or three conversations that you have about the pros and the cons in your money relationship. 
So the money dump. We still do a money dump. Yep, we do once it a year. Once a year at, oh, the, at the first year, in, at, first, at the first of January, in the first week, we always take two days, leave the kids with my mom and dad and go away and do goals. But we, as our goals, we do a money dump to say, you know, where were we this year? What did you think we did well? What did you think we did bad? And so we take you through the money dump. It is phenomenal, the stuff that couples get out there that didn't even know bugged the other person and little adjustments make make huge huge ramifications on the relationship. It's like flying an airplane. Two or three degrees, you make an adjustment and you land in California, not Washington. So by making those adjustments in your relationship, you the money dump is the perfect way to do it. Then what we do is we teach you how to have something called a money huddle. What a money huddle is, it's your monthly money meetings. Money relationships. Money relationships. We always say end. N stands for begin with the end in mind. Where you're gonna you're gonna basically look at your value. You're gonna evaluate your finances. That's E. Your N is your needs. What needs do you have? We're terrible as couples at telling people what we need. Mm -hmm. We're we're terrible at it. But especially when it comes to money, we're as a matter of fact in America we are so bad at telling each other what our needs are financially that sixty percent of women have a secret credit card, checking account, some kind of secret account. 35% 35% of men. So we're really good wow. at keeping money secrets in relationships. And then the D and N stands for dream. What are our dreams? After about two months of marriage, couples start, stop dreaming. And if the first diaper that gets changed, who has time for dreaming? I just have to make sure that they're selling my favorite brand of diaper, Costco. We forget <laughs> on a, on a discount. On discount, right, exactly. <laughs> if you're with, a saver. <laughs> with my points, if you're a saver. So, um, but those, so we teach people how to to keep regular money meetings. Here's what's so cool. That meeting is 45 minutes a month. Hmm. And what we find is that couples that do that talk about less, talk about money less in their relationships through the whole month because they just table it till the end of the month. The last thing we do is we teach couples how to fight fair. And we use a system called a stop, drop, and roll. And I don't have time to go into that, but think about, you know, like in kindergarten or first grade when the fireman would come in and say, hey, if you spontaneously caught on fire, this is what you do. Hasn't happened to me yet. I know it's important. Not not saying that you couldn't catch on fire, but it's the stop, drop, and roll method of fighting. Nice. That's great. I've got to ask the question at this point, and I've been thinking about this for a while. Is it that money in your guys's opinion with all the people that you've worked is money the the final ko punch to couples or is it that the fact is that these relationships are just toxic at the core and money's just the symptom that ultimately brings them down well here's the thing if your communication is bad the here's money impacts just about every decision and so yes it can be where it's just this symptom of a bigger problem but it really is at the core mm. and it can be, it's, it's indicative at how you handle this topic is indicative, indicative about, of your whole relationship. If you learn how to compromise about, you know, let's say Scott wanted to go out to lunch every day and I didn't want him to. And then he decides that he's going to go out to lunch twice a week. He compromised. I compromised. That's going to have carryover into if we think that our kids should be doing two sports or one sport, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's indicative because it comes up every day. How we handle this is going to have spillover into the other areas of our relationship. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just, it's not what people want to do is they want to say, well, we'll just keep our money separate and then we'll never have any money issues. Yeah. Wrong. You can't do that because if if a person doesn't like, for example, it's like almost like separate date nights. Yeah. Like I like action thrillers. She likes romantic comedies. So I say, you know, for the rest of our marriage, let's just do date night separate and we'll see how close we can get. Yeah. Well, that's not going to fly and you're definitely going to grow apart. So the same is true with your money. Yes, Mm -hmm. you do. You every day there is some kind of money decision that you make. So let's say that you just decide, you know, we're just going to keep our money totally separate. I have my money. She has her money. Da, 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 da. Then they're talking at night, they're having dinner, and they're talking, and they're talking about, I don't know, the grade of gasoline they put in their car. And and Susie says, well, I, I put in the high grade today because I just, I mean, I know that that's so much better for your car. It's going to make your car last longer, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's going to tick him off. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter whose money. 
It's just the fact that she put the high grade gas in there is going to take them off. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like they just, there's so many circumstances every single day. You can't say that your money's separate. And we almost chuckle every time someone says, well, we just keep it easy. He has his money and she has her money. Right. <laughs> really? Well, and I would have to think that a lot of this is being driven by belief systems, right? So at the core of this is belief systems. Fundamentally, whether you're talking about family of origin, like how you were raised and the way that that belief was. Um, we, think so. No? You don't no, think so? I, you know, no. Yeah, I don't think so either. No, really? So I no. really don't. Okay. And that because... goes back to that whole thing about the example of the Halloween candy. No one taught me to eat my Halloween okay. candy fast. No one taught me to trade it. My mom and dad didn't. My family of origin, my, my ethnicity did not teach me to do that. It's just the way that God made me. It's in my DNA. So you, you, yeah, so you guys are... You're, you're a strong believer that this is something that just is literally part of the DNA structure of an individual, it's not learned or the, the, the byproduct of our, our environment. Wow. Uh, you wow. learn how to save. You learn how to do the things that are that you don't naturally have a propensity to. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do them. Okay. But it's not the natural way that you, that you, the way that you think about life. If you think about it, the way your money personalities really extend far beyond just the dollar bill. Yeah. Um, a great example, I have a person at my office and he has had the same haircut since 1980. Okay. I change my hairstyle. I, every time you look at me, it's different. Okay. So we were doing these series of videos together. His hair is totally the same and mine over a four month period was like five different changes. Well, that's because I'm more of a risk taker. He's a security seeker. Yeah. I'm not going to do changes. Right. right. It just, it, it spills out into our whole, it's so much more than just the dollar bill. Yeah. So yeah. much more than the dollar well, I'm, bill. I'm glad we established this because I think what it, what it underlines is that you're not going to change your spouse when it comes to this. If this is hardwired inside of someone, there's no education or, you no. know, changing the environment. It's, it's core. I I've, so those statistics that you shared were alarming about the whole secret financial account. I had no idea that that was as big of an issue. Um, yeah. Why is it that couples are going to that degree of extreme? I would call that extreme where they're hiding a secret account. What's driving that? What's fueling underneath the, the, the need to be secret about uh, separate accounts and all this kind of stuff? Well, I think the core is trust. But let me list off some that we've actually, we've worked with thousands of couples. So we'll bring couples in and we have a term for it. We call it financial infidelity. And we think it works a lot like sexual infidelity in that often it starts with just, you know, one little credit card that was left over from what I had before we got married or one checking account that he doesn't know about that I've had forever and I'm just going to keep it and not bring them into, into, you know, into the loop on that. And now that everything's done online, it's so much easier mm -hmm. to have these secret accounts. So quickly to run through financial separation is one of the biggest reasons, because if you're separating your finances, but, um, you're, you're basically, um, you have the ability to have those secret accounts very easily. Well, one thing I was going to say is the reason why people go to that extreme is because, and like what Scott said, lack of trust. But they're doing it because they're afraid of the other person's response. Mm -hmm. A saver is, if they're married to a primary spender, is going to save a ton of money because they're afraid that that spender is going to go spend it. Mm -hmm. And so they hide money. Savers hide money just to hide expenditures and save just as much as spenders do. There's hiding of money because they're afraid of what their spouse is going to do. Right. A spender is hiding their purchases because they're afraid the saver is going to get mad. Right. You've got this. It's just an interesting dynamic. You're just afraid and you are who you are and you're afraid to say, I'm a primary spender. I'm a prime. Let's talk about it. I yeah. need a line item on our, on that budget that you put on to spend, or I'm going to go nuts. Right. And, and, and we have people who will email us and just say, I'm just done. I'm done with my spouse. I'm done with all the spending. I'm done with all the saving. Yeah. See, a lot of people want to put it that the problem people are the spenders, but it's not always that way. Sometimes the saver is so tight fisted 
that it makes that spender say, forget it. I'm not doing that anymore. So fear, so fear is driving this in a lot of ways. And, and control is another huge reason for, mm -hmm. for financial infidelity. If you've got awesome. somebody or a cause for financial infidelity, if you've got somebody that's totally holding onto the purse strings and they're not letting the other person jump in on that at all, then you're going to have financial infidelity. So I'll give you an example of one that we dealt with fairly recently. Um, we had a, a friend of mine who called me and he was just fit to be tied. And he said, listen, I just found out, I won't use his wife's name, um, has a $15,000 credit card that I didn't know about. We've got $15,000 of debt I didn't know about. Mm. Can we come in and talk to you guys or the money couple? You should be able to fix this. And I said, yeah, sure. Come on in. I said, before you do, I need to see the statements, the last year's statements of the credit card. So get online, scan them and email them to me. So Beth and I went through them and there were things like Target. There were things like the everyday grocery store. Expenses. It was everyday expenditures. And I'm going, well, that doesn't seem like, you know, there was no trips to Nordstrom's. Yeah. There was no, there was no shopping online. Spa days. Spa days or anything like that. So when we got there, I sat her down and I think she was ready and thinking that she was just going to get verbally lashed. And I said, I just need you to go through and explain these things. And they were, they were basic household things. The kids are back to school. That's why that's $800 in September because that's how much it costs to get their clothes and their stuff. And then I'm looking at him and he's kind of staring ahead. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, I turned to Beth. I said, this isn't her fault. It's his fault. Mm -hmm. He's holding his purse strings so hard that she has to commit financial infidelity because you won't, you won't relax about this. So really it's not her fault that there's this 15,000, it's your fault. Oh, and let me tell you something else. If you keep this up in two or three years, she's going to walk away from this relationship because yeah. you're controlling the finances. And so that's how financial infidelity so easily creeps mm -hmm. into a relationship is that we hear the word no so much that some person will just finally say, I'm done with no. Yeah. I'm going to set up a secret account. So we see it, you know, financial separation, overspending in debt, control, um, lack of planning and money secrets. Those are really the five major reasons that okay. people commit financial infidelity. So I think we all know that when you have, when you talk about um, infidelity in the sexual con context, the likelihood of a couple surviving, that's pretty minimal. Is that the case with financial infidelity? It, it can be that drastic. Mm -hmm. It, it kind of depends. You know, it's, sexual infidelity starts with flirting at the water cooler and then gets into a full-blown sexual right. relationship. Right. And financial infidelity, it starts with, you know, well, I said I was only going to spend $50. I spent 100 but I don't need to tell them. But then it gets on to full-on $36,000 credit cards. Yeah. People get divorced over $36,000 secret yep. credit cards. They so don't what, necessarily get divorced over $50, the water cooler discussion kind so of what, thing. What would you say to a couple who literally is walking in this uh, financial infidelity right now? Um, it's been exposed. Um, do they call you? <laughs> do we have a number? <laughs> yeah. They, they what, call what us, the they email time? us. We do, we do do coaching okay. and, and we have been able to get couples out of, out of situations like that because really what we help them do is set up an accountability, a way to talk to each other mm -hmm. about their money relationship where they're both, where they're both being held accountable and they're both being heard. Mm -hmm. Once again, if you go to what I would say the the old school of thought with financial planning is, well, you have $15,000 in credit card. Well, then you don't eat out. You don't, you eat ramen and, and ragu. Um, the kids, you know, have to make those shoes work for the next 18 months. And what happens is one person just totally shuts down the whole budget and the other person over 18 months dies. Yeah. And that doesn't work. Right. If you want your relationship to work, that doesn't work. So you can, uh, we know hundreds of people, they get divorced debt free and get divorced free and clear, but they hate each other mm -hmm. because they won't let me spend money. And it's all about the money for them. It's not about the relationship. And we only have our kids for 18 years and we never went on a vacation that didn't in, involve the, you know, skinniest, slimmest staycation that he thought or she thought we could afford. That's why they get divorced. Yeah. It's, it's not rocket science, right. but if you're to that point, yeah, you can make some real quick adjustments and you can start talking to each other differently and you can start compromising and you'll be shocked at how awesome that relationship can be. Yeah. Well, all these things that we've been talking about, um, I encourage those who are listening to go to themoneycouple.com. Uh, many of the 